Brian zone, if this is the gamma point, this is the K point, they, they go like this. With S orbitals, yes. C3 times, C3 by itself doesn't protect it, but C3 times, times this. C3V protects it, or C3 in inversion times time reversal protect it. But you have to do it only with PZ and SZ orbitals. If you do it with the SP2 orbitals, this would be the you know, e to the plus minus 2 pi i over 3 representation, and this would be the 1. So sp2 orbitals will have will have a will have the one showing up. So if gra if you know if I put my Fermi level somewhere you know, here in, in in graphing, I wouldn't see a rock point at this node, but I would see something else on a high symmetry line. So yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay. So now I'm gonna I'm going to ask. Well, what happens if I break this C3 symmetry? So far, I've argued. Oh well, graphing has you know these points are stabilized in graphing with C3 symmetry and inversion times time reversal. What happens if I break the C3 symmetry? Do, do the Dirac nodes gap? And the answer is yes, they gap at the corner zone, at the K point, but if I only break C3 symmetry smoothly, I can tune it up, but smoothly, the Dirac nodes will just move inside the Brillouin zone. They can't disappear. And the reason for that is there's a topological invariant for them, for, the, for their Fermi surface, that will, we will generalize very soon to vial nodes. So let's find out what that topological invariant is. So I'm breaking C3, but I still have inversion times time reversal. Okay? Which is, which is, um, um, just complex conjugation, okay? So that means the Hamiltonian has to show, it has to be dx tau x. I'm just doing tau so that you, that you don't take it as spin. This is still spinless. Plus dy plus dz tau z in some basis. You notice that I'm not using the graphing basis because the graphing basis would have this being sigma y. The reason for that is that in graphing this is really sigma x times, okay? But it doesn't matter. We're trying to not make statements about tight binding models. Specific model, we're trying to make gener generic statements. This is the PZ orbital Hamiltonian in graphene with inversion and time reversal, okay? You can't have the sigma y matrix because that's odd under complex conjugation, okay? As I said, in fact, in graphene, because this is sigma x times k, it has the sigma y matrix, but it has the, but it can't have the, the or the sigma the tau y matrix, but it can't have the tau z. But let's just no worry about that, right? Generic statements. Okay. So because this is true, I can now ask what's going to happen if my Hamiltonian is around the k point. So around the K point, I know that I have C3 symmetry before I break it. So I know that around the K, this, this big K point, my Hamiltonian was delta Kx sigma x plus delta Ky sig, or tau x plus delta Ky tau z, right? Before I break this, this was exactly at the K point, the small Hamiltonian. So what happens to this guy? I'm breaking K, I'm breaking, I'm breaking uh, C3. So now I can add some sort of a mass, right? Can I add m times tau y? Why? Viola is this. So the only thing I can add is m times tau x or m times tau z, right? So let me add m times tau z. I don't care. One of them. What have I done here? Well, obviously, my Hamiltonian is not gapless anymore at, del at the k point. But all I've done is I've moved the gapless point from delta k y equals delta k x equals zero, which, are the, which was the corner of the Brillouin zone in graphene, to delta k y is equal minus m delta k z, k x is equal to zero. So what I've done 
is I'd move this point, ah, shit, go this way, okay? Just because I don't want to draw it. I move this Dirac point a little bit like this, okay? But it's still stable. You can clearly see there's no mass that I can add here that will completely gap the point. So I moved it off the C3 eigenvalue of the C3 axis of the, of the, of the C3 invariant point in the Brillouin zone. I moved it inside the Brillouin zone, but it's still there. Okay. But now I know, for example, so, and I moved this one also, right? I moved this one also. There's another one at K prime here, right? We never talked about this one, but it's obvious. That there's two points in graph, yeah? Okay. But it's obvious that I can actually make, if I'm willing to break, if I'm willing to break C3 symmetry, I can make the following graph in lattice that still respects inversion times time reversal. I can make it, just dimerize the hell out of it here, make these bonds super large, and make these bonds zero. This respects inversion, right? Yeah, I can just invert here, respects time reversal. What are the eigenvalues of this graphene? Right, if I, I've broken C3, right, I've just dimerized it, just take graphene and squash it in one direction. What, what, what are the eigenvalues of this, this matrix? Very simple. Zero, 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 just T here. Plus and minus T, flat bands. Is this gapped? Looks gapped. So how do I get, I've just argued immediately that just by breaking C3 slowly, I can only move the Dirac points away from a C3 axis. I cannot gap them fully, right? I moved it from here to here. I moved it. But I've also given you an example of graphene where I just break the C3 symmetry very, very strongly. That's fully gapped. How does it happen? Well, the way it happens is that when you start breaking the C3 symmetry, so make this T prime, make this T greater than T prime, Okay, they move. Then they move a bit more if you break it stronger. Then they move even a little bit, little bit more. At some point, they reach the gamma point in the Brillouin zone and they annihilate. Okay? That means that there is a topological invariant with any Dirac node, associated with any Dirac node that tells you when they'll be able to annihilate or not. Does the logic make sense? If it doesn't make sense, to then say what, uh, what, uh, what's bothering. No? Makes sense? OK. So, OK. <coughs> In fact, it's very easy to find out what the topological invariant is of such a Hamiltonian. What you do is you take a Fermi surface. Instead of looking at the Dirac point, take a Fermi surface, looking, which is a finite energy, Right? This is the rock point around K, around K before breaking C3. You'll see that this doesn't depend on C3. Take a Fermi surface. Now you have a one-dimensional parameter, K, call it K around the Fermi surface, K Fermi surface. Right? It's K of theta. Right? It's just like I, I put my Fermi level here. Now K is K Fermi e to the i theta around the Fermi surface, right? This is a two-dimensional, the real and imaginary parts of this. Yeah? OK, I have two matrices, dx and dz. I can never have a dy, because dy would violate this. So then I can write a winding number of the Berry phase of this system around the Fermi surface, this Berry phase is the eigenstate of this Hamiltonian here, the eigenstate on the Fermi surface at k, partial i, phi of k, okay? This vector is this vector, okay? This is the Berry phase. And I can write the Berry phase around the Fermi surface. This is it. 
I can also express in terms of a two-dimensional Hamiltonian, which you'll find more revealing, is epsilon i j d i partial k, this k, partial k d j, OK? And this is a winding number. You can see it's a winding number from here. OK, this is, this is kind of a winding number, OK? So this d hat, actually, it's just d i hat is d i over square root of d x squared plus d z squared, OK? Is it clear that this is a winding number? If I express d, basically what d is here is just a circle, right? If I do, if I do this, if I define d i as d x d if I define di hat as di over square root of dx squared plus dy squared, or dz squared, sorry, dz squared, then I have di dx squared d hat x squared plus d hat z squared is equal to 1. Right? This is a circle, but all these depend on momentum. So what you, this winding number is as you're varying the momentum around the Fermi surface, you see how many times this d winds around its own circle. Yeah? Is it clear or not? Like, uh, I, gotta, I gotta get some feedback, because, uh, you know, like otherwise. Uh, so is, it, is this clear or not? And if it's not clear, what's not clear? So if, you are, if you are going to express this guy, dx and dz in terms of a cosine of phi and a sine of phi, OK? And compute this. This is just integral over the Fermi surface d, this, over this, this path in the Fermi surface, over the Fermi surface, of partial k of this phi. OK? So that just, this phi is a function of k, obviously. I guess it's a function of k. So it just tells you, so this is phi, phi, phi also winds as k winds. OK, so that's why it's a winding number. Very good. OK. In fact, uh, right, but it's not always quantized. So this is something very good, yes. So. This is something that it's always, you can always define, but usually this thing depends on the parameters of your Hamiltonian. Like, for example, I could always define this for a gap Dirac Hamiltonian, but then this would depend on the gap and the, the ratio between the gap and the Fermi surface. So the statement, yes. So the statement that I'm making is that in this case, the Berry phase around the Fermi surface, which is this winding number, is equal to pi. And this is the famous pi of a Dirac, if you just compute it. Okay, so, sorry. Uh, right. was not clear. So, uh, now, if you try to do some distortion that is breaking a C3 or not, you can define this winding number for the like, yeah, right. Right. Okay. right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's the point. Yeah. So exactly. So I'm defining this winding number. Now, this Dirac point, this winding number is not very interesting when this guy sits at the K point, because I knew how to do how to show you that it's a Dirac that is gapless at the k point, OK? But when I move away, because it's just representation theory at the k point, but when I move away from the k point, it's no longer representation theory, right? Just like vile fermions, which we'll talk about, are not a representation theory uh, uh, thing. They're, uh, they, they, you know, they, they have a topological invariant that's not just given by group theory, OK? Or like point group symmetries. Right, so very good. So as Dario said, there's when I move away from, from the k point, this invariant is still quantized, is still, is still pi. In fact, you can prove that with inversion and time reversal, it can, it can only be pi 0 or 2 pi or 3 pi. The reason for it is the inversion times time reversal. This is a phase, right? It's a very phase, so it changes phase to minus phase, so only 0 pi, et cetera, are the ones that are allowed. Okay? If, if this was to break, if this was to have a gapped mode, this invariant would depend on the gap 
over kf, for example, in the limit of kf larger than the gap. And if I put my Fermi level in a gap, it would be zero. So it, would, it wouldn't have a quantized, quantized expression. OK. As an aside, what I want to point out is that this is more than a Berry phase. It's actually a Z invariant. Berry phases are Z2 invariant because they're phases. Berry phases show up into e to the i integral of AIDL. But with this symmetry in graphing, you can actually have an integer invariant. And the way you see that immediately, I have the same symmetry in bilayer graphing that's spinless. And in bilayer graphing, in terms of instead of having at the k point a Dirac node, I have k plus, k plus is kx plus iky, k minus squared. I have a double Dirac node at the k point in bilayer graphing. Now, if you compute the Berry phase of this, it'll give you 2 pi. So you'd say, oh, well, 2 pi is 0 because the Berry phase. No. It's more than a Berry phase. This is a z invariant. And it tells you that, for example, this double point in graphing cannot gap. What it can do is it can split in 4 or more or less if I break C3 symmetry. It can split in, it can split in Dirac nodes, in linear Dirac nodes. But this, the sum of these, invariants, these, these, these winding numbers have to be preserved. OK, so now we understand what happens in graphing. The, when I break C3 smoothly, this, this point in graphing has plus, very phase. This point, this, uh, this point has minus, just one second. They move inside towards the center. They annihilate. They gap. Yes? Question. It's not. Uh, you get a tight winding. Uh -huh. Yes, so there's a meaning in terms of like, so if you want to use the language of the pseudo spinner, right? That's why Alexand Alexander, uh, when he showed the time reversal at one cone, right? You, you can find a matrix at one cone that acts as a spinful time reversal, even though it's spinless. I remember there was in the, like four lectures or six lectures ago, he took spinless graphene, okay, and showed that you can. Find a matrix, of course, it's not a local matrix in real space, a time reversal matrix with spin that, that, that this is un invariant under. That's the, this acts, uh, the rock point with the Berry phase pi acts for all intensive purposes like a Kramer's doublet. Okay? Remember Kramer's doublet, the way it looked? If I look here, it's got the same Berry phase pi. Berry phase pi, so if you want to think of the pseudo spin as a spin, you know, you can, but I wouldn't do it. I don't like that. that, 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 uh, that um, but, but, that's, but that's the physical. Does that make sense? Uh, I, mean, I would like to say some fundamental geometry stuff of physics. I mean, um, yeah. You have a thing that you like to Yes. And you can associate the curvature. And the curvature is If you integrate around the whole Brian zone, yes. Now, when you, but when you use A, you get zero. Well, you get the well, no, 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 no. You can't have just one. That's that's a fine-tuned situation. But what, at least, okay, good. You, but you have, I mean, you, just, you know this, but well, I mean, if you work in one fixed gauge, I mean, A, you are usually using the Dirac spring. So ah, no, 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 no. This is, yeah, no, 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 no. This doesn't have to, yeah, yeah. This doesn't have to do with that. So. This is, that, that would be in three dimensions. I would be missing uh, this, and, and I'll, show, I'll show this. I can, I can compute this without gauges. So what I'll do is I'll take, the, I'll take the Fermi surface, and instead of taking the Fermi surface and computing this A whatever, what I'll do is I'll partition my Fermi surface. You know, I'll do basically what Ivor uh, uh, taught. I'll partition my Fermi surface like this, OK? And I form the projector into this band. And then I take the projector here, times projector here, times projector here, times projector here. The eigenvalues of that, that's just the Wilson loop around. The eigenvalues of that is, is this. Well, it's e to the i times this. OK? Those are the eigenvalues. But you can follow, you can, you know, so you can, you can just take the, so the pi by itself is not, is not gauge variant. I can just take the projector. The projectors are gauge invariant. And this is exactly this sandwich into in between two states, but the eigenvalues are a gauge invariant. Well, I guess I could just 
Yeah. In 3D, I'll have a drug string coming out of, and I'll show you. I'll show you. Them. Okay. Okay. So we understand graphene. Okay. Let's understand. Let's go to 3D now. And I'm going to keep on the time reversal thing. And I'm going to, I'm going to switch back to spinful time reversal in graphene in, a, in 3D. Any questions? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just, I'll just finish tomorrow. Ten minutes, yeah. Okay, it's up, I mean, yeah. Okay, yeah, ten minutes. Okay. The point of the, the moral of the story is that in two dimensions with symmetries, you can define invariants that are very much Fermi surface invariants. They will be very much in the spirit of the Weyl invariant, which doesn't require any symmetry in three dimensions. So let's see what happens. So there's all this talk about vials and how they happen. Well, it turns out that vials are everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean everywhere in condensed matter physics. If spin, I have spinful, now spinful, so t squared equals 1, I'll relax this symmetry. t, equals, t squared equals minus 1, I apologize. I'll relax this symmetry later. But no inversion. So inversion. I used inversion here because I worked with spinless graphene. I've argued that if I have inversion, in spinful cases, bands come doubly degenerate at every point. So crossings between them have to be fourfold degenerate, because two bands and two bands. And they usually don't happen, un unless in the Dirac case, in which is a different story. OK, so spinful t squared is no inversion. So these bands are singly degenerate, except for eight three dimensions. Eight time reversal invariant points. Okay? So add this eight time reversal invariant points, what must we have? How, ma how many states do I have at each of these points? At least two, and generically two. So what's the Hamiltonian around every each of these points? Use sigma, sigma being Sigma i, what's the Hamiltonian around? Sigma being the spin, just a two-band model. What's the Hamiltonian around each of these points? K i sigma i, where i goes from 1, 2, 3. Does this look like a Val fermion? So this is called a Val fermion, right? Now, every type of reversal invariant system in any dimension, in any, in any, uh, in any, um, sorry, of mine walked in and I got uh, uh, lost. In three dimensions, uh, any um, spin, any um, time reversal invariant system without inversion will have Val fermions, and the Val fermions are just the Kramer's doublets. Okay? Why don't we see them? Well, we don't see them for different reasons. So normally, what they do is that this splitting here is proportional to the spin orbit coupling, which is a momentum based when you project. So this splitting is very small, so the bands immediately t turn up, okay? In normal, you know, in like, uh, with, if you plug in parameters. But any system, any time reversal invariant system has valve fermions, it doesn't have inversion. So, how would it look? Well, okay, so. How would, it, how would this system look if I now break time reversal? So instead of having time reversal, by the way, I can write down a simple Hamiltonian for this, sine ki sigma i, at all over the whole lattice. Right? This is val points at every of these eight points. OK, how would this look if I now break time reversal? So I can break time reversal. Do I still have doublets at this point? At, at this point, or this point, or this point? I don't have time reversal anymore. Do I still need to have doublets? No. But, if I break time reversal by a small magnetic field, what can happen? Well, I can add, pick this point, for example, ki sigma i plus b sigma z. Right? So what happened to this guy? I've moved the Kramer's doublet from the time reversal invariant point to kz is equal to minus b. OK? In other words, I don't have any symmetry, and I still have stable nodes. And that's the, 
That's, this, this, that's what vile fermions are, right? Vials are stable without any symmetry in 3D. Okay? And this is why you say that they are equivalent. Yeah. Any time reverse invariant system will have them. Any time reverse invariant system will have Fermi arcs. That's like a well, this is not a well, well. Somehow it's not, I mean, it's not pointed out in the literature, but every, every, every material has Fermi arcs. Any material that you know will have Fermi arcs. The problem is, uh, you know, the problem is uh, the parameter regime in which you can see them. Because these, uh, the, the, the splitting is just spin orbit coupling proportional to the momentum. So, and then the k square term will immediately take over. Okay, so, but I'll, I'll go through this. Okay, so <clears throat> let's understand the stability from several points of view. And the first point of view that I want to understand is um, um, what Alexander said about the, 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 um, the Dirac node. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I've broken time reversal. The Val node still exists, of course. If I break it very, if I if I make this b infinity, then my Hamiltonian just has two bands plus minus b. So I know that I can't have gapless points. But what happens, just like in graphene, is all these vials that have moved away from here, all these eight vials will recombine in some way that's model dependent and will give you a gap, gap state. But to understand how they recombine, we must define the topological invariant for them. And I'll define that in seven ways. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. If we want them at the corner. The C3 symmetry in graphene yes. keeps them at the corner. I just, yeah, all I need, all I need, so I just, I just showed you that, that with time reversal, there are vial nodes, but then I broke time reversal. So I have no, no less, so with, with time reversal, there's vial nodes, and they're stuck at time reversal invariant positions, and they actually have Fermi arcs, I'll show the structure. But then I break time reversal. I know I can't, if I break it softly, you know, not massively even, like if I, if I can add a magnetic field I'll never be able to add a magnetic field that's, you know, electron volts. So if I add a small, mag normal magnetic field, I'll just move them away from the, from the, from, from here. I can't fully gap them. I'll gap them at the time reverse invariant points, but I just move them away. So they have to be stable without any symmetry, as a corollary. And of course, we all knew that on, I mean, we know that for about valve fermions. But this is just a different way of looking at it. I think. Can I ask another? Yes. Right. So usually we have things that are annihilated because they have opposite symmetry. Right. But your, your invariant was uh, dedicated to pi, so is there something which is opposite? Ah, no, it was pi. Yeah, the k point was pi, and the k prime point was minus pi. If I would compute the same thing at the k prime point, I would get minus pi. Because, oh, it's, right. it's, 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 yeah, it's really a winding number. That's why it's not, in graphing, it's a, that's why it's not, that I don't like to call it a berry face, because it's really a winding number. Because the symmetry protects a winding number, rather than that's why, like, uh, yeah, I can define this two pi, like the double layer, the double layer graphene point is a two pi. Okay, so just by parameter counting, you know, ki sigma i. So the first thing that I can see, if I ha if I have a node, so a node somewhere in the Brillouin zone, so this is somewhere. Now think of it as having it somewhere. Okay, here. Okay, say I just have one in the Brillouin zone. I'll show you I can't have just one. This is the Hamiltonian with k around that node. You can see that I can't add, if I add any mass term, if I add m sigma z, I'll just move it around. This is the same thing as there. Okay, but now I can actually go to some chemical potential. So my Hamiltonian put a chemical potential. And the Fermi surface will be given by a two sphere. Anything with Kz having this will be occupied. Okay, this is the Fermi surface. What well, below this will be occupied? Okay, right. And 
I can write the eigenstates on the Fermi surface, so the momentum appears here. The eigenstates, if I say that kx, so this is, this is, you know, this is k Fermi squared is equal to mu, so k Fermi is equal to square root of mu. There's some velocity here which I took to 1. So kx, ky, kz is equal to sine theta cos phi, sine theta sine phi, cos theta times kf. This is the momentum on the Fermi surface, right? It's an S2. Is that clear? Yes? No? Yes. Maybe? OK, good. So I can write my eigenstate. This eigenstate will be 1 over square root of 2, square root of 1 plus cosine of theta, sine theta over, just diagonalize the 2 by 2 Hamiltonian, plus cosine of theta e to the minus i phi. There's something weird about this eigenstate. You can clearly see that this eigenstate, when I go to theta is equal to pi, OK? This is finite, because you can just expand it, right? It's theta over square root of theta squared. So this is just 1, OK? But when I go to this, psi of 0, 0, minus 1 to the south pole of the Fermi surface, the eigenstate gives you 0 e to the i phi. What's the problem with this guy? Hmm? Yeah, so what, what, sorry, I couldn't hear you, but uh, I, this is the point on the, on, the, on, the, on the Fermi surface, which is the north pole, right? What's phi around that point? If I go in one direction from phi or from another direction, I get different values for this. So that's called bad gauge. <laughs> okay? And this is the, the Dirac string. Now, I could do, what I could do is multiply my wave function by e to the i theta, i phi. So I could, it's a gauge choice, right? I could just, and this would be one here. I could do that, right? It's still an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Any phase, I multiply. But now, it would be badly defined around the North Pole. There is no way to pick an eigenstate which is well defined everywhere on the Fermi surface. The reason for that is that if I look at the Fermi surface and look at the configuration of the eigenstates, there's a string coming out. In this case, it's coming out of the South Pole where the gauge, where the wave function is not uniquely defined. That's called not picking a uh, a sm you, can't pick a, you can't pick a smooth gauge over this Fermi surface. And the reason for that is that this Fermi surface has a churn number. Okay? So you can't pick a smooth gauge. But we'll talk about this. So in this case, you can see the problem is, is the South Pole. I can pick the problem somewhere else. I'll always have a problem. And that point is a point where the we, you call it the Dirac string, comes out of the center of the Fermi surface, intersects the Fermi surface, the wave function is not uniquely defined, and moves somewhere. Now what you know is the following. In high energy theory, what people do is they take this Dirac string and move it to infinity. They have an infinite cutoff. As in condensed matter, we can't do this because we have a finite cutoff. So this Dirac string has to go somewhere. It cannot come back into the same Fermi surface because if it came back into the same Fermi surface, I could move this, this singularity here, I could move this singularity here, or annihilate them. It has to go somewhere else. That's the true nielsen niemeyer theorem, which says vials come in pairs. Okay? So the Dirac string coming out of the Fermi surface, the one goes into the Dirac string coming out, goes into a Dirac string into the Fermi surface of another one. OK? All right. Do I have five more minutes or not? I do? All right. Cool. Good. OK. <clears throat> Moreover, I can ask you to do a calculation. It's done in the notes. Take this wave function, psi. And now, remember how we did it for the rock? We did a. This, I, I would compute A, which is psi partial K psi, okay? In this case, I can compute A 
of phi and theta, okay? And I'll find out that this is non-zero just for partial phi. Okay, it's a tangential. So if I look at the Fermi surface of one vial at fixed theta, so this is theta, fixed theta, and this is phi, I can now compute this Berry phase, integral from 0 to pi, a phi theta d phi. I'm just going to take the projector and do this. This is in, so Evo explained how you do, you, you know, you diagonalize the position operator. Basically, it's just taking the position operator and multiplying it however many times you, have, you want around, however many times you want to discretize around this circle. That would be the, that would be basically this. Okay, this is called the Berry phase. Of course, it depends on theta. Call it, actually, let me call it the Wilson loop. Let me call it the log of the Wilson loop. You don't, I'm not going to explain what this is, but it's a definition so far. It's a kind of a fancy definition. I don't think there's an I here, because I didn't put it here, so it's fine. Okay, we're good. Okay, I'm going to take this. This A of phi, we can just compute it from there. This, sorry, this thing, I can just compute it, is 2 pi sine squared of theta over 2, 1 plus cosine theta. Doesn't depend on phi anymore because I integrated, but depends on theta. Okay? So notice what this does as I move theta from 0 to pi. Okay, what does this do? Well, this, this is the theta. So now I have a, right, I have a two-dimensional Fermi surface. I take cuts. I compute the Berry phase on each of these cuts and look at how the Berry phase changes as I move the theta. And this is integral of a phi d phi as a function of theta. At zero, it's zero. Then it goes, and at two pi, at pi is two pi. Okay. Right, can you see it? Well, just plot it. It does this. <laughs> you can see that at pi, this is finite. At 0, it's 0. At pi, this is finite because 1 plus cosine theta is theta squared. It's the difference theta squared between pi. And this is just theta squared, so it's 1. OK, so it goes like this. So Berry phase, as I take a vial fermion and look at the Fermi surface and compute the Berry phase as, you know, around azimuthal coordinates and look at its look at its expansion, or look at its evolution as a function of theta, it will wind. Now this means that the, this is equivalent to the Fermi surface having a churn number. The winding of one is equivalent to a churn number of the Fermi surface, and I'll take three minutes to explain to you what that is, and then we'll go, we'll go, uh, what's it called? We'll go church. So, so, um, or, Okay. So this is one way of doing churn numbers. You just look. This is called. This is called a Vanya um, um, a center in the unit cell. Well, for this, for this is on the Fermi surface, and you look at how it evolves as a function of, of, you know, the angle theta, and you see that it winds. If I didn't have a churn number, if this wasn't a vial fermion, if I was looking at something that looks like this this would stay constant, it wouldn't, it wouldn't wind. But since I have this Hamiltonian, this k sigma, what I can do is I can also just work in Cartesian coordinates rather than polar coordinates, and I can compute a of k, which is just a transformation of this guy, a of k is equal psi of k, where psi that eigenstate, partial i psi of k. This is partial i is this. OK? So now I can do f. I can compute a field strength, which is the Berry field strength, which is a partial i. These are all derivatives in momentum space. a j at momentum k. This is the component of this vector, minus partial j a i at momentum k. This is something that you can plug into Mathematica and do it in 30 seconds. You just plug in that matrix, you say diagonalize, you get one of the eigenstates, you take derivatives, 
and you're done. Mathematica will do it for you. And you'll find out that this is epsilon i j k i j l k l over k cubed. Okay? That's what you'll find. We don't need to go through it, but as an exercise, you should just, just plug in the Hamiltonian and do this. Okay? This looks like a monopole, first of all, right? If it was a real space, this would be a monopole. And the way you know it's a monopole, well, you integrate it over a surface that surrounds the origin. If I integrate it over a surface that doesn't surround the origin, I'll get zero. But if I integrate it over a surface that surrounds the origin, which is the singularity, and take the proper one over four pi, I'll get one. Okay? And this is the monopole strength. And that Dirac string is just, you know, the same. It's basically just monopoles in real, sp in, in momentum space. Okay? So, I think this is probably a good, oh, uh, oh yeah. The other thing that I wanted to point out is you'll hear normally that, right, everybody heard that quantum Hall effect is the same thing as a churn number, right? Having a churn number is, everybody heard that? Everybody heard that quantum Hall effect needs time reversal breaking. Or churn numbers need time reversal breaking. But here, I have a churn number. This is the same thing. This is a churn number, right? Just of a Fermi surface. But I've argued that I can find vials even in time reversal breaking, even time reversal invariant systems. So how can that be? Well, churn numbers require time reversal breaking only in two dimensions. In three dimensions, they don't. The reason for that, this is F of K, is that if I add time reversal, This field strength at k, which is this very field strength, it's like a magnetic field. So time reversal flips the mag magnetic field, but flips momentum. It goes to minus f of minus k. OK? So if I compute this over a 2D Brion zone, OK, I'll just take the actual computation that I'm making. This is like a BZ. OK? I take BZ times the normal, Z. Okay? And that over the Brion zone, because of this, half of the Brion zone contribute one number, the other half will contribute exactly the other number, vanishes. But for a vial, you can clearly see that this is a B radio, the B is like a monopole radio, and what you're doing is you're integrating over the Fermi surface. So you're integrating over element DS with a vector here. So time reversal also sends ds into minus ds, ds at k into minus ds at minus k. The time reversal also flips the vector on the Fermi surface. Whereas in two dimensions, you don't, you know, you can't flip this in two dimensions. You don't have a, the third momentum. So in other words, time reversal is perfectly consistent with churn numbers in three dimensions on Fermi surfaces, but is not consistent with churn number on, in two dimensions. Even though the three the Fermi surfaces, Fermi surfaces in three dimensions are two-dimensional surfaces, right? This is a two-dimensional surface. The Chern number is perfectly consistent with a two-dimensional surface in three dimensions, but not consistent with a pure two-dimensional surface. With a, with a time reversal. Time reversal and Chern numbers are not consistent with two dimensions, but they're consistent with three dimensions, Fermi surfaces. Okay, so thank you. So any questions? Right. But I mean, I'm, it's it's gapless stuff, but I'm still looking. At, you see, like it's it's gapless, but I'm looking on the Fermi surface. Yeah. The other band. If I look at this band, this band is actually gapped from, from the other, right? So. Um, 
you need you need a two dimensional manifold. But that manifold can be embedded in three dimensions. That's okay, that's sure. Which is which is what this is. Right. Yeah. Okay.